Okay, so this is unit two of the uh, broker pre-licensing course. We're gonna go over opening a real estate office, everything that's involved with that. Who can be a realtor? Who can, who can be a broker? Who can't be a broker entity-wise? Uh, we're gonna go over things like advertising and then the basics of operating a, a real estate office. So this is a little bit different than stuff you would get in the sales course, uh, but there will be some overlap. So just go on ahead starting. It's gonna start, we're starting here with business entities and what entities are allowed to be real estate companies, right? So there's a chart on figure 2.1, you see that? It says, we may register as a real estate brokerage if we're what? We're, we're a corporation, so like an S Corp, C Corp, we're a general partnership, we're a limited partnership, a limited liability corporation, limited liability partnership, or a sole proprietorship. Now, the questions you usually get on this are based on a negative question on the real estate exam. So let's look at the things that can't be an entity. Corporation soul. What is a corporation soul? A corporation soul is a church. Okay. Joint venture. Joint venture is me and you, me and you maybe joining up and doing one deal on a flip, right? It's something we're doing in joint, but once the joint venture, once that one thing is done, that, that is no longer there. So we can't be a brokerage because we're doing things one thing at a time, right? That's what joint venture is. Business trusts, cooperative associations, and, and unincorporated associations. So unincorporated associations or cooperatives are typically dealing with neighborhood type situations, right? Business trust is self-explanatory. Um, so we'll look at the sole proprietorship first for things that can be entities, because the question again is going to be which of the following can't be an entity. And it's going to say sole proprietor, it's going to say corporation, it's going to say limited liability corporation, and it's going to say corporation sole. Well, we know that a corporation sole can't be, right? But people get that conf confused a lot because of why? Because sole, sole proprietorship, corporation sole, both have their word sole. So you think that means that you can both do it, but the corporation sole is a church. We have to remember that. Now, as a sole proprietor, you're the only owner, right? You're, that's what it means, right? Sole means separate. We're personally liable, right? As a sole proprietor, when I first started this company, it was a sole proprietorship. I lose, it's, I'm, I'm all invested. So whatever we lose, I lose. We're responsible for not only the debts, but the torts. If I make a mistake, if I do something wrong, I'm responsible for that. I have to fix it, right? Two things that you're going to see that are always in common with the DVP, with the uh, corporations that can become a registered brokerage. You have to register with the DPPR, Department of Business, and you have to register that trade name with the DPPR as well. Now you're going to interchange the DPPR with SunBiz a lot. Remember, SunBiz is going to be your fictitious name registration. It's going to be your division of corporations actual filing to become a corporation. So you're going to do that first, then you're going to register that name with the Department of Business, right? You're going to have that qualifying corporation assignment number once you do register with the Department of Business, the one we were talking about yesterday. So far we're good? Mm -hmm. All right, so then we have these things called partnerships, right? So corporation sole is easy, it's one per, or not corporation sole. Sole proprietorship is one person, right? Then we have partnerships. Well, partnerships is more than one person, right? Two people, three people, two or more people. And we have general partnerships, and then we have limited partnerships. So in a general partnership, everybody's liable for everybody, right? Everybody's responsible for everybody. All partners are personally liable for the debts and torts of the business, right? Each partner can bind another into a contract. So what does that mean? That means I can sign a purchase sale agreement for you. I can sign up for advertising for you and you're responsible for it. Hey, hope we're good together. Hope, we're, <laughs> hope we make the right decisions, right? That, that's really what it means, right? General apartment 
these, these partnerships can be dissolved by, you know, if somebody passes away or if there's a withdrawal or a bankruptcy, some type of negative impact on both partners, we can dissolve this, right? We get sued, we run out of money, the partner can now go away. Now, the thing with a general partnership, at least in the real estate business, is that one of us has to have a broker's license. So we can't do a general broker. We can't do this without having a broker's license. Right? One has to be, and anybody that deals with the public in a real estate capacity has to be licensed as a real estate person. Right? It has to have some type of either a sales license or a broker's license. Everybody that is a broker has to be listed on the application, right? So if you're, if you have five brokers that are real estate brokers, you have to register all of them on the DBPR. Great to know that, right? Sales associates can't be general partners. And you can see that on page 37, we're talking about that, right? Mm -hmm. We talked about trade name slightly. Trade name is creating a name on some this. And you're gonna to have to register that with DVPR because they need to know how you're doing business with the general public. Right? Now, limited partnerships are a little bit different because there's usually one general partner, one limited partner, you could have more partners than that. Limited partners are only investing some type of cash, property, some type of goodwill to that company, right? And they're only gonna be responsible for that piece of it. So if I donate the building to open the company, and everything goes under, I'm only gonna be liable for that building piece, for that property, right? I'm not liable for your $600,000 in debt because you made a mistake, right? I'm only liable for that. So there's an advantage of being a limited partner in that capacity because you're, you're limited to what you could lose. Whereas in a general partnership, you'd be responsible for everything. If you are going to name this corporation or be a be a uh, limited partnership, then you have to use that term LTD or limited. And that's in the gray box, but that's one of the critical things when it comes to advertising. That's why it's brought up. Anybody on top of page 39 talks about general partners who deal with the public have to be active real estate brokers. That's just given. Again, it talks about sales associates. There's a lot of duplication here. It talks about sales associates not being general partners. Limited partners are not registered to be required. They're not required to be registered by the DVPR. That, that's, a, that's a big one. So the very last bullet talks about limited partnerships or limited partners do not have to register with DVPR. Only general partners. We have to know that. But limited partners cannot be Brokers. Limited partners could be a broker. Okay. Could be a broker. Limited partnership, I would, I would look at it as like you're kind of a shareholder, right? You have a you have a financial interest in a company, right? You've either put money into the company or you've put property into the company. It's like if I buy stock in IBM, right? I'm not a partner, I'm a stockholder. But let's say I buy stock, or in this case, I'm putting financial um, contributions into the company. If I lose on the stock market, I can only lose what I put into my stocks. It's the same thing. If I lose and I only put, say, $10,000 into this company, I can only lose $10,000. can't lose anything else, right? That, that's, the, that's the concept behind it. And then we have corporations, right? In the real estate business, you have a lot of corporations. We're set up as either LLCs or S corps typically. Sometimes there's a C corp thrown in, but most of the time it's an LLC or an S corp. And the tax advantages are different based on what, how you want to structure it, and how much money you're making, and you know that's that's out of our scope. Um, but when you have these corporations, then it's, a, it's an individual, it's on their own. It's somebody that's a separate entity. So when you create a corporation, it's like an artificial person. Right? They have this perpetual existence, is what they call it. And you can be profit or non-profit, it doesn't matter, right? Just because you're not for profit doesn't mean you're not making money. It's just going out to the salaries and everything else and then being reinvested, right? We're not 
actually making a profit other than operating expenses. Right? That's what not for profit really means. For profit means obviously I'm making money. Right? So those things are all things that can be real estate brokerages, offices. Right? If you have an officer or a director in a company, one of them has to be licensed as a broker. Unlicensed or inactive people could serve as brokers, or off, I'm sorry, not as brokers, as officers, but if they are active, they have to be registered. It, you don't really need to go into a whole lot more detail than that as far as corporations are concerned, because they don't ask extremely in-depth questions. Uh, but what they will ask is, who can register and who can't register, right? I would say memorize one. Who can't register? I would memorize who can't register. And if you think about the theory behind it, it's easier for you to remember. So we can talk about how many members are in the, there, there's questions on here. It talks about how many members are in a S corporation, it talks about how we create general partnerships, um, as corporations, just for your knowledge and for everybody else's knowledge, it's, it's limited to 100 stockholders. You can't have more than 100 stockholders. Um, so that's why a lot of times when you start an S corporation, you'll issue 100 shares of stock, right? And if it's a solely owned S corporation, then you would hold 100 shares of stock in theory. Could you sell the stock to other people? I mean, you could, you know. I don't know how many people would invest in it, but you, you could. Um, and then you fill out this form called 2553. So everybody starts out as an S Corp. Everybody starts out as a C Corp, sorry. And then you file a subchapter S when you need to um, declare that, right? So that, that's the difference, right? So I'm gonna go over these questions. Um, these questions aren't typically what I would see on the state exam for you to. But we can go over the questions. I'm just going to pull up the answer key, not the exam questions. I don't remember what page it's on. Practice questions, so unit two practice questions, page 540. We didn't cover chat for the first question. The first question is a general partnership must be created with a written document. It doesn't have oh, to be. Yeah. It can be it can be done Oral orally or, or, or however you want to do it. Right. A domestic corporation is incorporated in Florida and does business in Florida. So that's true. So the difference between a domestic and a foreign corporation is not what you would think overseas or onshore, right? What it is is if you incorporate in a state and you're doing business in that state, then you're a domestic corporation. If you are a oh, domestic to that if you're incorporating state. in say Minnesota, but you're doing business in Florida, then you're foreign to that state. So you're becoming you're called a foreign corporation. Right? That's what it, that's what a domestic and a foreign corporation is. So that should be true. An S corporation may have more than no more than fifty members. That should be false. Right, right. So S corporations may not have more than a hundred shareholders. Married couples count as a single shareholder. And then sole proprietorship must register with the Department of Business, but not the Department of State. So when they talk about the Department of State, we're not registering with the Department of State. We're filing a corporation status with the Department of State. We're not registering with this. We're registering the company with the Department of Business. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So we're, we're, that's actually a false statement. We don't read, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I lied. I thought I read the negative. 
question should be true. Should be true. Sorry, because it says but not with the Department of State. I thought it said yes. with the Department you of have State. To, yeah. So it's you register with the DVPR, but you don't register with the Department of State. You file with the Department of State, but you don't register. I said it right the first time, and then I right. read the question wrong the second <laughs> like, time. So I was like, wait, hold on a second, let's do this right. So <laughs> you file with the, the Department of State, you get your registration with the DVPR. The DVPR. So after these practices, we, we talk about vacancy of office. The biggest thing you need to know about vacancy in office is that two things happen. So let's say I'm the broker of Super Sexy Realty, right? Okay, and I die, right? I have a car accident, I die. It's morbid. Um, what happens to everybody's licenses? Because I'm the only broker. Well, we have to fill this vacancy within 14 days. We have to fill this vacancy. If people are doing business, we have to fill this with a temporary broker within 14 days, right? We have to declare this person. Once we get this temporary broker in place, we can then do a full-on broker assignment within 60 days. It has to be done within 60 days. If it's not done within 60 days, then we then are no longer in business, right? So the temporary person needs to be replaced and placed in position in 14 days, and then we have an additional 46 days, right? So it's 14 to 60. It's not going to be Oh, it's not combined. Yeah, it's combined. Okay. 14 plus 46 would be 60. It's combined, right? You don't get 74 days. That's what I'm asking, so it's not 74. Oh, okay. And 60 days inclusive. That's really all you need to know about vacancies of office. If somebody is not, we can't do new business until we have a broker in place, right? We can only do the existing business. So, because there's no broker, right, we can't do any of the activities because technically you're not, you're not supposed to do business, right, because you're not active at that point. If your broker's inactive, then you're inactive, right, right away, right? We talked about that already. So, practice questions on that. Oh, wow. <laughs> are exactly what I just covered, right? The practice questions are, the only active broker for a real estate partnership dies, the vacancy must be filled within how many days? The vacancy, temporary or permanent broker, has to be within 14 days. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. But you have to have that permanent broker by 60 days, which is the next question, right? Real estate corporation may appoint a temporary broker for up to 60 days without the need to register the DVPR. However, at that day 60, we have to register the actual permanent broker. Does that make sense? Temporary broker only lasts 60 days. And these are calendar days. We're not talking about business days, these are calendar days. Right? A lot of things are business days in this business, but calendar days. So you got those right, I'm sure. Right? Real estate corporation may appoint a temporary broker up to 60 days without the need to register in DVR. That's true. Vacancy must be filled within 14 calendar days. That's true. This should both be true. Both answers should be true. Six. I lied. I was wondering, so six should be false because... No later than 60 days. Sorry. No later than 60 days. We have to register with the DVPR. So six is false? Six is false. I missed okay. the question. I read it wrong again. See, I'm really bad. That's okay. So, I'm not in the... I must be in a really weird mood today or something. <laughs> so. <laughs> so then six is a temporary has to be within 14. Correct. Okay. Correct. 100%. Yeah, 100%. But remember, you can't, after 60 days, we have to register no matter what. Okay. We have to register them. We have to tell everybody about them. They can only be in place as a temporary broker at that point. Okay. After that, we have to have a permanent broker in place. And then five was still true, or did we have 60 days on five? Five is true. Okay. Five is 14 days. Yeah. Five is 14 days. Vacancies have to be filled in 14 days. Temporary broker must be registered with DVPR no later than 60 days. Okay. Temporary broker. So you have, you have 60 days, up to 60 days to register. After 60 days, that's what I meant when mm -hmm. I said that. You have to cease to do anything. Right, right. At that okay. point, you're done. So then right. the other agents have to find a new home. They have to find a new home. 
Okay. And you're going to see when, when you lose a broker and you have a vacancy in an office that you're going to see agents going somewhere else anyway. Because a lot of times a relationship is a personal relationship. It's not a corporate relationship. Right. Okay? So I may not like the new manager, so I leave. Okay. I may like this manager, so people come in, you know, the new manager. So um, if the real estate business killed you, then you're probably in the wrong business anyway, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but who knows, right? So business trusts, right? Business trusts were one of the things that can't be, right? they can't be a registered corporation. Why? Because business trusts are created to complete transactions within that trust. Like they're, they're created to engage in those transactions, right? For their own property, their own real property. So it can be a number of people, um, but typically they're done just for business, not for sales, but actually dealing with your own business. So that's why you're not a real estate office, right? Then you have the cooperative associations, right? We know what co-ops are, right? Co-ops are usually these large buildings, right? And they have shareholders, right? You have a thing called a proprietary lease and you have a shareholder and there's a board and it runs almost like a condo, but you don't own, you own shares in, in the company. So that's why it's not a real estate company. A real estate entity. When we talk about real estate entity brokerages, we're talking about actually practicing buying and selling real estate, not the actual way it's held, if that makes sense, right? So that's why they can't be a brokerage. Unincorporated associations are something that's non commercial, right? Um, and then we have this thing called an ostensible partnership. We talked about that at the end of class yesterday. Mm -hmm. talked about that so ostensible partnership is you're running this office i'm running this office next door we come in we're talking all the time and somebody comes in and they, they ask you a question and they come in another day and they ask you a question and both times i'm in here the third time i'm in here they ask me to do something real estate related i do something it's wrong you get in trouble for it because why because we're guilty by association i like to say guilty by association right the assumption is, is because we're always together, we're doing business together, the general public doesn't know differently. So we always have to disclose that we don't work together or something like that. A stenciful partnership or a quasi partnership makes you liable for somebody else. It's that appearance that this partnership agree, uh, that exists. And it doesn't always exist, but it appears that way to the general public, right? The example here is brokers sometimes do business in the same office building. This is allowed as long as we have our own signs, we have our own advertising, right? We have our own phone number, we have all these things, right? If not, it's considered an ostensible partnership and we can get sued. We can be liable for that person and it's illegal, right? If you operate as an ostensible partner, it says that you can lose your license, right? It says you can be suspended. Illegal in the sense of the business, right? We don't wanna be giving that perception that we are allowed to do something. Um, so there's more practice questions. Corporation sole is a business entity owned by one individual. This is that question that's tricky, right? Corporation sole a church right <laughs> so because it's a church the answer to that is false correct because it could be owned by multiple people that's the biggest one you're going to see you're going to see joint venture come up too those are the two biggest ones you'll ever see for the answers if two parties are not partners but give the public the impression that they are a reasonable person i'm uh, sorry and they and a reasonable person could assume they are partners then we're considered limited partners that's oh, false. false. It's an ostensible partnership, right? Brokers of two separate brokers or firm agreed to combine efforts to, to market a large shopping mall. The two brokers have formed a joint venture. Is that true or false? Remember what a joint venture is. You're doing something temporary, temporary on a one one time basis. So are they doing something temporary on a one-time basis? They're advertising, combining efforts. Maybe there's a exclusive agency listing agreement, right? 
where whoever brings the, the buyer gets paid, right? So maybe these two brokers said, okay, there's an exclusive agency listing with you and with me. Why don't we combine our efforts? And if we get this together, we'll both, we'll agree between ourselves to split that commission 50-50. It's a joint venture. That's exactly what it is. So in this case, number nine is true. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. okay. So they're just getting together for this one just for this one transaction. A joint venture, you do the one thing, and when it's done, it's over, and you're never alone. You're no mm -hmm. longer. And that's why you can't be a corporation, right? Because you're not continually doing business perpetually. Right. So we have trade names is the next thing, the next title. Trade names are fictitious names, right? That's the name that you're going to come up with to start your corporation as a broker. If you decide to be a broker, most people take the class and become a broker associate. They don't really move on from that. But everybody else gets in the business and they're like, I want to be the next best thing in real estate, so I'm going to open up my brokerage, right? I'm going to go on to SunBiz, right? Department of Secretary of State. They call it Department of State. It's also called Secretary of State. You go on that website. You, you find and see if your name's available. You register the name, or you file the registration. Then you move over to the DBPR and you get your get your uh, qualified corporation number, right? That's, that's how it works. And they're gonna say use DBPR or DB form RE12. Okay, RE12 is the form that we use to register that corporation with the Department of Business. Now, here's the thing. It's all done online now, so you're not gonna print out this form and do it. You're just gonna go online, you're gonna attach the documents that you've gotten from Secretary of State, and then you're gonna send over this corporation and pay the fee done. So let me ask you this question. As a real estate agent, before you become a broker, or even if you're a broker associate, what are you allowed to incorporate? Um, only your name. Only your name. Yeah. Your name, or you can... You can also do it, you can say you're a professional association, right? So, the PA. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I can say I'm Jimmy Little John PA, right? But I have to register that, right? Um, I can register my name as Jimmy Little John Incorporated. Right. right. That's it, right? I can't do. It has to be your full name. I can't do C. Thompson Realty, right? Right. Because Realty is not allowed as a sales associate. It's one of those things that gives you the perception that you're a brokerage, right? You can't, so I can't say I'm C. Thompson Realty Inc., right? Because that's a separate company. I'd have to be a broker of record, right? So I use that example because the cat. Um, <laughs> the cat's gonna love my video, but she'll, she'll hate me because I brought something up again that I keep bringing up over and over and over. But here's the thing. If you register it incorrectly, the bank doesn't know the real estate law, right? So the bank will let you open an account under C. Thompson Realty, right? Because they don't know that you're a broker. They're not checking to see if you're a broker's license. So now, if I'm writing a check to C. Thompson I'm Realty, I get in trouble, bank. right? Mm -hmm. But if the bank has their bank account open wrong, then they can't open the bank account. They can't deposit they can't do it because it's not, check. right, so the check's bad, right? Yeah. So it's not only important for you as a real estate agent to incorporate properly, it's also important that the broker Make sure that you do it properly because I can't write a check to that name, right? Dave Bada has his name incorporated, Dave Bada Inc., right? I can put his, I can write a check to Dave Bada Inc. because he's got everything on file with me. Now, if if Cat opens her own real estate brokerage and it's named C. Thompson Realty, then I can write a check to them as a referral fee, right? Because she's a broker. Because right, referrals go broker to broker. So we didn't do these questions. Did we skip a page? No, we did. We're on page 48 right now. That's what you were going over the fictitious names. Yeah, so the fictitious names, right? Yeah. So, and then we talked about professional. So I already flipped the page. So there's a lot of practice questions in this chapter. So, 
A licensed real estate broker is a sole broker and owner of real estate brokerage. Brokerage company handles residential transactions. The broker would like to set up a second branch to run commercial side of the business. The broker may register a trade name for the commercial office and continue to use the corporate name for the principal office. So what do you think? Is that okay, false? Because I think that's two false. different brokers. You have to have two different broker registrations. Right, but which means you have to have two different broker licenses, right? Right. right. Okay. So, so here it says registering a branch with the Department of Business and Professional Regulation allows the brokerage corporation to engage in real estate brokerage activity from the principal office and a branch office location, but the branch office would be required to conduct business under the same name as the principal office. If the broker decides to register the trade name or doing business for both, then both offices would need to use that trade name. That's where the false came in, okay. right? corporation may be registered under one trading. So here's the thing. Let's say, and I know we're not supposed to talk about other brokerages in this class, but let's say I'm a Coldwell Banker agent, right, or owner, right, and I have 38 offices for Coldwell Banker. They're all operating as Coldwell Banker, right? They're all licensed as Coldwell Banker. Right? If they have a commercial division, they're still Coldwell Banker. They're still operating under if they change the name to CCB Realty, whatever, then they have to now have a separate registration, separate broker, you know, or the same broker can own both, but it has to have that registration, right? Because brokers can own more than one real estate company. Why? Because multiple licenses are allowed if you're a broker. Right. So then if you had two different offices, even a branch, like we were talking about yesterday, I still have to have two different brokers or operating brokers, right, for both offices? It depends. If it's an owner broker, they can manage more than one office. Okay. They okay. can manage more than one office. So, no. So I would say if you have two separate entities, I can manage two separate entities. I can manage two separate offices, right? Because okay. I can have multiple licenses as a broker. Most of the time they have a manager designate because, why? Because there's too many people, right? Mm -hmm. You don't want to try to manage 300 or 400 people when they're conducting real estate transactions. You want to have a small group that you're in charge of. You know, 100 agents is a lot of agents to be in charge of. Um, a lot of the managers are in charge of 100 agents, but that's why things slip through the cracks and that's why people get in trouble. Right? So it'd be better to have 20 agents that you're watching over and you can make sure that all the transactions are being done properly. So part of the part of the problem with foreign corporations, remember what a foreign corporation is. A foreign corporation is I've incorporated out of state, but I have an branch office in the state, right? Operating in the state, but I have an incorporation out of state. So what happens is, and then people do it for legal liability issues. Right? So that's why you see a lot of credit cards in, in Delaware, for example, right? Because the laws are different in Delaware than they are in other states. So let's say I incorporate Delaware and I'm doing real estate in Florida. Do we see a problem with that if I get investigated? Well, of course it, it is because now I'm falling under juris jurisdiction of another state, right? So how do we get around that as a real estate broker? Well, if I'm operating in Florida, then I have to given writing to the Department of Business here that I'm willing to cooperate in any type of investigation in the state, right? So that, that's the only thing you really need to know about having an out-of-state branch office is that we have to give that authority to be able to participate. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, true or false, can we open a brokerage office as a broker associate or as a sales associate, can we open our own office? No. No. Can we open our own office and pay part of the dues if our broker is agreeing to be the broker record for that office? Not as a, not as a corp corporation. You can't officially say that's my office. Right. But you can say, hey, will you open the Bay Meadows location for this company? I'll pay half the expenses. Will you be the broker for this office? Yes, that's okay as long as the broker as long as the broker is agreeable to taking on the responsibility for that office, 
then you can't. But as a sales associate, as a broker associate on your own, you can't. So they, the, you can't. It's a false question. It's a false statement. I can't open it. No, it's false. The broker can appoint a broker associate to manage that office, right? We can be the manager. You don't even have to be a broker associate to manage an office. You can be a sales associate to manage an office. The problem is that, with that is, is that most sales associates aren't going to be respected. If I have a broker associate answering to a sales associate, people are going to be like, well, I don't, why should I answer to them? They don't know, you know? So you're hardly ever going to see that happen. Uh, but you will have broker associates, you know, and they usually will actually create brokers of record, multiple brokers of record for different offices. A lot of big corporations do. Um, so branch office requirements need what? You have to you have to register that branch office with the EBPR. We talked a little bit about that yesterday, right? When we talked about group licenses or multiple licenses, um, we have to renew those every two years. So every branch office you have it gets renewed every two years qualifying corporation license and then you pay those fees every year every two years same thing um, I can't remember how much it was I want to say it was like 60 bucks something like that so I just did mine this year um, but every every one you do you do separately so if you have a school you have a real estate company you have a branch office you do it all separately um, and again those aren't transferable talked about that a little bit right so if we open a new office, what happens? The other office ceases to be enforced. We talked about that. And we don't do business in the new office until we actually have that registered, right? We continue to do business in the old office as long as it's open. Then we move to the new office, we start a new business there. That was the 14 days? Or? Right. So good news is on the state exam, they usually don't ask you how many days. There might be one or two questions, but most of the time it's not how many days. Um, temporary shelters are not registered, right? Temporary shelters are not registered. They're not branch offices. If you're regularly doing business there, however, you have to you have to register that, right? But temporary shelters are usually like you go on site for a new construction thing, you see a trailer on site, and that's where they're doing business for like a week. It's not a permanent structure, then they get their model all built. Another right. All right, so here we go. So Practice questions 13, 14, and 15. A broker wants to register a recreational vehicle, so they have an RV as a branch office. The DBPR will reject the broker's application as the, R as the RV as a brokerage office. Why? Well, is it true or false, first of all? Of course that's true, <laughs> but why? Well, it doesn't have a permanent address, right? I could be parked in Publix parking lot today and move to Home Depot tomorrow, and there's no way you could find me, right? The reason we register is so that we can be tracked down, so we can be investigated if we need to be. <laughs> A lot of times if you think about these things logically, you get the right answer without even knowing the concept, right? Registrations issued to a branch are transferable to different locations if the move is within the registration period, is that true or false? Oh. It's false, right? It just says we're not transferable. True or false, a broker may register with the Florida DBPR, a principal office located in the state of New York. That's foreign corporation. Yeah, I know. But I you can. You can? You can. It can be registered in New York and do an office here, or we can register here and do an office in New York. They're, they're doing it backwards so that you get confused, but the definition of foreign corporation is I register in a different state than my principal office. That's what this is described as. So it's true, 15 is true. 
Now what's more important for the state exam is signage for the doors, how we're supposed to put our name up, how we're supposed to tell people who we are, right? So you have entrance signs. There's gonna be three things on an entrance sign, right? You're gonna have your trade name, if we're using a trade name, right? So if we're using Super Sexy Realty, we put Super Sexy Realty on the top, and then we have two other things on that sign that are required. We have the broker's name, right? And then we have the words, licensed real estate broker, or LIC real estate broker. Right? There's only two ways you can do that. So ABC Realty, John Smith, real estate licensed real estate broker or can't have anything else. It has to be either LSC period real estate broker or license spelled out real estate broker. These are the only two ways you write it. This is how I see it. The fonts can't be little tiny, you know, one of them little tiny, one of them little tiny. Now, if you wanted to put a sales associate or a broker associate under here, You can put the sales associate's name on the sign as well, or broker associate, but it has to be on a separate line, right? So you can put here, Jane Doe, broker associate. Does that make sense? Yeah, so John Smith is the one who's registered. This is the registered broker right, record. But, doesn't, but then Jane Doe is the one who's actually managing it. Uh-uh. Oh, okay. John Smith is your broker of record. John Smith is your manager. John Smith is your boss, right? If you have an office manager, you would put them down here, right? So let's say you had a sales associate that was the manager, right? If you wanted to list them on the door, Joe Biden designate manager. Whatever, right? Sales associate designate, whatever. Yeah, yeah. But we call them sales, we call them designates, but it would be sales associate, and then you could put slash manager, right? Hopefully he's not running my office, but mm -hmm. let's see. Um, that was it for that piece. The signs, the signs are easy. It's three points, trade name. Licensed real estate agent or broker, sorry, licensed real estate broker, LIC period real estate broker, the name of the broker above that is in that order. Name, broker name, licensed real estate broker. That's how it's written on your sign. You can list, there's no rule that says you can't list everybody's name, but why wouldn't a company list? sales associates names on their window on their door sign because they'll change it's going to change all the time so it, you're constantly spending money changing signs so why would you want to do that but if you have a long term if it's a family business a lot of times you'll see john smith licensed real estate broker jane smith broker associate tammy smith look broker associate you know what i'm saying they'll have they'll have when it's a family business you'll see that but most of the time you don't see that because it's too much effort and too many chances to make a mistake, right? So you have your true and false questions. DBPR regulates the size of lettering on entrance signs. Well, they do. They do. They're false, I think. Huh? No, I don't. No, they don't. They don't? Or they do? They don't. They don't, but when you advertise. Yeah, you're right. They don't, they don't 
It has to they be. They don't regulate the actual size. They don't regulate the size. Right. It, it has to be. Yeah. So here's the thing. It doesn't. They're not going to regulate the size. If everything's one inch, everything's one inch, right? Because what if my association says I can't have anything larger than a half inch? DBPR can't find me because my association says that, right? But what they will say is you can't have this at one inch and this at two inches and this at three inches, right? It has to be concise and, and it has to be in agreement with other things, right? So the answer to that would be false, right? There must be clear distinction between broker's name and the names of company sales associates on the sales sign. If there's brokers, if there's associate brokers or if there is sales associates, you have to have a distinction between the two. So most people put a line like I did here on the board, right? Or they just don't do it at all because if you don't do it at all, you can't get in trouble for it, <laughs> right? If the broker associate's name is included in the office entrance side, the word realtor may be included next to the associate's name to indicate license type. No, the answer is false, false. The only thing that can be written is this. That's it. Now, you could say we are realtors in advertising, but not on your actual entrance side. Good. Now, when you open an office, we run into a lot of compliance issues. So this is one of the compliance issues you would run into. We have another compliance issue surrounding the American with Disabilities Act. Right? Americans with Disabilities Act is an act that was formed around 1990 to give handicapped people the same access to the properties and the same access to commercial buildings as everybody else should, right? It's public accommodation, right? So the biggest one is, can we get in the unit? Can we use the bathroom? Can we do any of these things, right? So we have to comply with on new buildings with the current code pertaining to ADA, right? So if we need to have wide enough doors, we need to have uh, proper facilities, maybe it's a bar to hold on to or whatever for a handicapped person, right? Or like the lower uh, light switches. Lower light switches. That stuff would be important if it was to accommodate somebody as new construction, right? Now, if it's an office building, you don't necessarily have to have the light switches lower, but you do have to have ADA accommodations. You have to have wide enough hallways you can't, that, that people can get in and out, right? That's also fire code, so you're gonna be protected on that for the most part because it's gonna be done right. The other thing you have to have is parking spaces, and this is the one that comes up a lot, right? For every one, I'm sorry, for every 25 parking spaces, you have to have one I don't even know what's in the book, but you have to have one handicap spot for every 25. Okay, so 26, you have to have two. If you have 26, you have to have two. If you have two, you have to have one. Right. Right. So from one to 25, you have to have one space. 26 to 50, you have to have two. 51 to 75, you have to have three. Right. So for every 25 spots, you have to have one handicap spot. That's pretty much all you need to know about ADA stuff. Now we're gonna adopt those standards, right? State, federal, we're gonna adopt all these standards. We're gonna, we're gonna mirror those. So it says the Florida Americans with Disabilities Act Implementation Act, sorry, adopts the federal ADA standards in Florida construction and codes. So do you think Florida is gonna be in compliance with basically the question is does Florida mirror? Yes. Of course they would. Right. Right. Of course they would, right? How about this one? A broker maintains a brokerage office and a brokerage residence. That makes the broker exempt from ADA accessibility requirements in all parts of the residence except for the room where the brokerage business is conducted. Hmm. 
Is that true or false? I would say false. Like he it's has, false. Why? He has, to, he has to go and say. It's false. Why? You can say why. No, I'm just saying it has to be. It's a, if you're running a business with any establishment that you're running a business, then it has to be ADA compliant, whether Correct. it's a resident. Correct. Or, yeah. So if I'm running a business and it's only in this room, that's there's no bathroom in this room. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So so if you think about it logically, again, you get the right answer, right? So the answer is false. Right, we are not grandfathered in. Right, if the structure is built in 1960, we would be grandfathered in for that piece. Right, but we still may have to provide some type of accommodations, reasonable accommodations. Right, so if we can build a ramp and make it more accessible, then we should because why? Because it's reasonable. If it's if it's a third story of a building that didn't have an elevator, then we've got to figure something else out, right? We probably shouldn't rent that office. But it's building code. But we would have to maybe rent a first floor unit or something like that if it didn't have an elevator. I couldn't have an, a home office and accommodate somebody handicapped if I was on the third floor of a three-story condo. Wouldn't work because there's no elevator. Right? But the four story condo would be fine. It'd be elevated. So you could have a three story condo office that you're operating out of yourself, but you can't run your brokerage Correct. out of it. Correct. So you can't be bringing comp customers. facing customers. Mm -hmm. So, like, my home office was at the office, right? It's at the house, right? But when I bring customers, I bring them here because. Mm -hmm. I have no choice, right? I need to have accommodations for handicap. I have handicap spots here, right? I have an elevator here that's on the third floor. Right? So those kind of things matter. So then we talk about advertising. And this is an overlap from yesterday a little bit. So talk about advertising as an individual, advertising as a person versus advertising as a corporation. What's the number one thing you have to do if you're advertising as an individual agent. Always have your broker. Always have to have the broker. That's the number one thing. We always have to have the broker because advertising is a broker activity. It's part of that a bar sale, a bar sale thing, right? Advertising is number one. Advertising is a broker activity. Advertising has to be done under the supervision of a broker. That's why the broker's name has to be on there. And the broker, when we say broker's name, we mean brokerage, right? We don't have to say, John Smith's my broker, John Smith Advertising. No. Whatever company it is, Super Sexy Realty, ABC Realty, that's who has to be on that piece. And what is advertising? Advertising could be anything. It could be business cards, could be social media, could be just side of your car, it could be anything you want, right? Me personally, I wouldn't put advertising on the side of my car. Why? Because if I get in a car accident, now we have liability issues with the company as well. I prefer not to do that. And we have this thing called team advertising. Well, something about team advertising that's important is when you have a team, and let's say you have 12 agents on your team, advertising should be assigned to one person, right? Advertising should be assigned for one person. What do I mean by that? That one person needs to be responsible for that advertising. Not that they create it all, but they need to be responsible for that. So they should be reviewing that. And the way it works is you're supposed to have one person designated and they're supposed to be updated every month and kept on record with your broker. I don't know if it even says that in there, but, but it, that's part of the responsibility of it. Um, it does say in here, at least monthly, the registered broker must maintain a current written record of each team's group members. So the group members plus that person should be looking at the advertisement. Right? So that's why it's important when you have teams in a real estate company that you keep current with everybody's license, right? And who's where, because what if I went from team A to team B, and now team B's messed up on their advertising, but I still have a role team A, then it kind of creates a problem, right? So what kind of things can't be named in team names? Well, the same thing can't be used in a, a independent realtor's name or independent real estate agent's name is the same thing you can't use in a team name. So I can't say, I'm the North Florida group of 
I, I can say I'm the North Florida group, but I can't say I'm the North Florida agency. I can't say I'm the North Florida real estate or realty if I'm not the actual broker of record. We're talking about advertising a team, right? I can't say I'm the Metro Brokers team, right? I can't say that. I can't say brokers, all these terms, agency, associates, brokerage, brokers, company, LLC, LLP, partnership, corporation, properties, property, real estate, anything that would tell the general public that I'm a real estate company if I didn't know any better. You can't use any of those in your team names, right? I can say I'm the home team, but I can't say I'm the realty team, right? I can say I'm the Beaches team, but I can't say I'm Beaches real estate. I can't say I'm Beach's real estate team either because the term real estate can't be in there even if it has team, right? I'm the Southside Properties Group. I can't say that because now that's letting the public know that I'm a real estate company when I'm not, right? These are the things that can't be the team names. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I can say I'm the North Florida Group of ABC Realty. So what happens or what is it called if I didn't put the brokerage name on my advertising? What is that called? You know, mm -hmm. it's called blind advertising. So blind advertising isn't allowed, right? Reasonable people have to know they're dealing with a real estate licensee, right? If you don't put anything out there, house for sale, three bedroom, two bath, on the water, $312,000. Really good deal, but it's dumb, obviously, at that price, right? Call Jimmy at 103-456-79, right? 10, whatever the number is, right? Well, they don't know if I'm a realtor or if I'm just a layperson, right? With an ad written like that, I should be a layperson. I shouldn't be a realtor, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, what if it is a real estate agent? They have to say that they're a real estate agent. We have to know that the, we're not a layman in this case. We are a professional. So because we're a professional, we have to disclose that we're a professional. And if we don't, it's considered a blind advertisement. That's why, and you see it on social media all the time where people have pages and they don't put their brokerage. They just say, hey, I'm James and here's my house. No, you can't do that. When you advertise, there's one thing you always have to have in the advertisement on top of the brokerage. If they say, call somebody, what do they have to call? They have to call the last name of the person, right? You have to have your last name. I can't say call Jimmy and say, I can say call Little John because that's my last name, right? So you always have to include your last name in the advertisement. You always have to include the brokerage information. And that kind of goes on to the next topic where adding your personal information. So licensees may in introduce their personal name. They can't insert, they can't insert their personal name into the advertisement, right? You can, but you always have to have at least your last name. You can have a nickname, but you have to give your legal name. You have to give what's on your license, right? That's what's important, right? Last name is required. So we'll use a mutual friend. We'll talk about that. So Dan McKinney, we'll talk about Dan McKinney. He's going to watch my video and be like, oh, look at that. He brought me up. But if you want to get skinny on the property, call McKinney, right? Well, it's his last name. So it's a legal advertisement, right? That's important, right? So as long as you have that last name in there, you're good. When it comes to advertising, it doesn't matter what you're, what you're printing. Could be magnets, could be yard signs, could be flyers, could be rack cards, business cards, banners, whatever it is, you have to have that brokerage information on there. That's the critical thing, right? Anything that would be misleading to the public would be considered false advertising.
We have to be accurate, right? Three bedroom, two bath can't be a three bedroom, one and a half bath. It needs to be a three bedroom, two bath, right? It has to have, what, closets to be a conforming bedroom and egress, ingress windows, right? Is that, is that what we require? I think so. Um, so in, so the perception can be wrong. And I'm gonna use an out-of-state example because in the state of Kentucky, we have a lot of basements, right? In Florida, we really don't have very many basements. There's a few, but we don't have very many. In Jacksonville, I only know of maybe a half a dozen, um, just because the water table is so high, right? But in Kentucky, there's a lot of non-ingress and egress windows, right? You can't go in and out of these windows. And the bedrooms are in the basement. So those are not bedrooms. So a house that has four bedrooms in the basement, two bedrooms upstairs would be considered a two bedroom house, right? Because we can't advertise it any other way. That's where this false advertising comes into play because somebody will, well, that's a six bedroom house. No, it's a, it's a two bedroom house with sleeping quarters downstairs. See, so it's advertising correctly. You advertise this as a bedroom, you advertise a one bedroom condo as a two bedroom condo because it has a den, but has no, no closet and it's a non-conforming bedroom. So you could advertise it as a one bedroom with a den or you could advertise it as a one bedroom with a non-conforming bedroom that you're substituting and it would work. It has to have a door, right? That's like the wording, but in, in MLS you can't have but it in MLS two. Can, correct, right. correct. So we have to look at the wording. So again, it can't be falsely advertised, right? We have to have that door, we have to have that closet, we have to have that window, right? Now, false advertising you would think would be self-explanatory, but a lot of times people want to stretch it. And a lot of times to please your customer or your client, depending on what type of brokerage relationship you have, you stretch the truth to, to help your customer or client. And what happens is you get in trouble because you're the professional and you know. You need to push back on your customer or client and say, hey, sorry, we can't do that. It's in a violation of rules and advertising, right? So that's why it's important to have a designate to review that. And guess who the designate to review it is? Designate to review it is your broker, right? Or a team advertising effort that has somebody registered with the broker, right? Either way, one, one or the other, you have to do that. So you can't say, on your business card, I'm part of ABC real estate team, because you can't use the word Correct. real estate. So you as the broker would be fine as well as I would, or just- We're both responsible for it. Right, okay. Right? We're both responsible for it. In fact, you may get a lesser fine than I do, right? Because why? Because I should know better. Right. I should have somebody looking over your shoulder. Right, right? and even if we didn't come to you, it doesn't matter. Right. It's still- So I've actually found on a few occasions where an agent has done something without my review and we've had issues so I'm sitting and I catch it because I review everything and I tell them no you can't do that you can't do that you need to run this by me right everybody makes mistakes our job is to make them better and do the right thing because we don't want to hurt the public the whole thing is is we're doing this for the protection of the public right the Florida Real Estate Commission is developed for education and and protection of the public. That's what it is, fostering education and protecting the public. We're not here to find a bunch of real estate agents. What we're here to do is do the right thing every day, right? So then now, you know, going back to the late 90s when the internet started getting really up and going, everybody started doing their own websites. Now we have these internet data exchanges, we have all these things, right? So everybody has their own website, right? Well, what do you have to have on your, on your advertising for a website. What do you think you have to have on your advertising for your website? You have to have a brokerage name, right? You have to have contact information as well. Brokers information, contact information has to be immediately adjacent to whatever the whatever the page is. So like on my real estate page, it's every page. I have my information on every page. You want to make sure that you have it all congruent throughout. All, the page. Yeah, all through the page, right? Okay. 
The next part talks about unauthorized use of association names. So really, that boils down to an ethics thing. Um, you can't false advertise. It's ethics and false advertising, right? I can't say that I'm a graduate of real estate institute if I haven't taken the course and passed the course, right? I can't say that I'm a realtor if I haven't joined the board and taken the oath of the National Association of Realtors, right? Oh, okay, so like right. if I have a bunch of certificates but I'm labeled under you, you can't use... I can't use them, right? right. You can. You mm -hmm. can say I'm Mickey Vice GRI, right. for example. Whatever, right? yeah. So don't put all these abbreviations, because what happens is the perception is, oh, well, the more abbreviations you have, the more specialized you have. Maybe I'm a, a certified residential specialist, right? Maybe I'm a relocation specialist. Maybe I'm whatever, graduate real estate institute or commercial expert, whatever the case is. I can't say those things with the actual designation if I haven't taken the course. Now I can say, I specialize in commercial real estate. I can say that all day long if I want to, right? Because that's not a designation. But if I put the little code there, then it is a designation. I can't say that I'm a realtor if I work for a builder that's not a member of the National Association of Realtors, right? Because I'm not a realtor, I'm a licensed real estate agent. We're not a licensed realtor. Anytime you see that word licensed realtor, I'm like, no, you're not a licensed realtor. You're a licensed real estate agent who is a realtor, right? Those are the things that differentiate you between somebody else. Because all realtors are licensed real estate agents, but not all real estate agents are licensed. Or Correct, same thing with all, all squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares. It's the same thing, right? <laughs> yeah. It's the same thing. All licensees are real estate licensees, but they're not realtors. All realtors are not. All realtors, all realtors are, well, they're not actually either because you get other licensees in the oh, okay. war now. But, but in a theory, all real estate agents have a real estate license, but all real estate agents are not realtors. Licensees selling real estate by owner do or do not need to disclose their uh, professional status. I'm gonna guess yes. We always do have disclose. to disclose. disclose. <laughs> we always have to disclose. disclose, disclose so real disclose. estate real estate owners, even if you have a for sale by owner sign in a yard, which you're allowed to do, you still need to put owned licensed real estate agent. Right, because you need to let the general public know that they're not negotiating with a lay person. They're negotiating with somebody who does it every day inside and out because you can't have the upper hand. The whole point of that is to create a fair environment, right? To protect the public. Now, I, this kind of falls under advertising, and I feel like it falls under advertising. It's a rental list. It has to do with rental lists, right? So there's two things you need to know about rental lists. Number one, if you're in violation of, of the rental, I like to do it this way. If you're in violation, you've done something wrong concerning a rental list, it's a first-degree misdemeanor. It's punishable by one year in jail and $1,000 fine. I call it the 1-1-1 one, one, one rule, right? The 1-1-1 one, one, one rule. It's one year, $1,000 fine. This first degree misdemeanor. And I'm going to go into detail about this. It's one year in prison and $1,000 fine. It's easy to remember that way. The only one you're going to have is with the rental list. This is the only one that's ever going to show up on state exam. The only first degree misdemeanor. First degree misdemeanor is providing a rental list for a fee and not giving accurate information, right? So what happens if I charge somebody for a rental list and it's wrong, right? If it's completely wrong or it has a lot of, a lot of issues with it, they can seek compensation. They can seek money back. They can seek 100% return of their money. So if I charge somebody $100 for rental list, 
and they don't, and it's it's not accurate information, and they don't get the money, and they don't get a rental, they can get 100% back from us. However, if the information is accurate, and they don't get, they still don't obtain a rental, they can get 75% of their money back. So what's the point in charging for a rental list if all there is is a downside to it? And they're probably gonna get it for free anyway. These two things are important. If the tenant doesn't obtain a rental, even though they have an accurate list, they can get 75% of their money back, right? So if I charge them 100, I can get 25, I can only keep 25 of it. If any of the information is not current or it's inaccurate, materially speaking, they get all their money back. And then they can report us and then we can be subject to a $1,000 fine or a year in prison or this misdemeanor charge, right? I don't want to have any of that. So what's the point? Just provide them a rental list and when they find a property, refer them out, get your, get your referral fee, right? You can pay the referral fee, why? Because you're a real estate agent, because you're licensed, right? Real estate referral fees have to be paid through who? Broker. Broker. So here's the questions. Real estate sales associate is placing an advertisement for a listed property in a local newspaper. Sales associate wants to include his first name in the ad, however, he wants to admit his last name. Right there it tells you we can't do it. It goes on and says, it requires another line of print for that last name, which increases the cost of the ad. It is sufficient, true or false, it is sufficient for the sales associate to put his, only his first name in advertisement, as long as he includes the name of the brokerage firm. Well, it's two things that are required, not only the name of the brokerage firm, but also the last name of the associate. They can omit their first name and not their last name, so in this case, the answer is false, right? There's a million Jimmy's, but not as, you, well, there's a million Smiths too, but yeah, normally not as many, yeah. Most people that have a common last name are not gonna just put their last name in there because they don't wanna give the advertising to somebody else. Right. Um, it makes no sense to do that, right? A prospective tenant paid $100 for a rental list that was outdated. The prospect is entitled to a $100 refund. However, a request for refund must be made in writing. I don't think so. The request, well, is, it must be the request, the request does not have to be made in writing. Yeah, because it's on. Yeah, the request does not have to be made in writing. It's false. So it's false. Team names, this is concerning team names. Using the team name, best team realty is a violation of the commission rules. True or false? It's true. It is true because the name realty assumes that we are a real estate company, right? You wanna take a break? You good? Okay. Do we need to you or? Mm -hmm. uh, I just wanna make sure you're good. I'm good. Seeing how we're all on time. Fair housing. And advertising. So, fair housing is something that's come up a lot and it comes up all the time. And I, I want to bring something in, I'll be right back. So, we talked about the commission rules, right? We also talked about what's required for real estate schools, real estate companies, we have this beautiful poster, right? Equal housing opportunity poster, right? So this is required in a real estate office as well as a sign. Um, if you don't have this concerning fair housing, you're automatically guilty, right? Automatically guilty. If somebody accuses you of one of the fresh corn violations, this pertains to the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which was race related, and the Civil Rights Act of 1968, 
which is everything else, right? And the acronym for that is fresh corn with no valves. And this is familial status. Race, sex, handicap, color, religion, national origin. These are the protected classes. I believe that the protected classes are going to change in the future to include other things, orientation, etc. Right now, this is what is established, right? It is illegal to discriminate against any person because of race, color, religion, handicap, familial status, national origin, sex, right? In the sale of rental housing or residential lots, advertising sale of rental housing, in the financing of housing, in the provision of real estate services, in the appraisal of housing, and blockbusting is illegal. We're going to talk about blockbusting as, as one of the discriminatory practices. We're also going to talk about redlining and steering. This poster doesn't say that you're not discriminating, but this poster says if you don't have it, you are discriminating, right? If you don't have this poster, you're automatically discriminatory, discriminatory in your practices. So even if you, yeah, so step one to even have a fair case. You have to have this poster. This, this, poster. this, this poster right here has to be posted in public view as soon as you walk in the office. That's why I left the room to go out to the front so yeah. that you can see that the poster is posted where it should be, right? Um, and when we talk about this advertising, we're talking about residential advertising, or we're talking about residential rentals. We're talking about anything like that. We're not talking about commercial. We're talking about residential. Right? Commercial's got a whole different set of rules, especially when it comes to handicap status because of the amount of spaces needed, et cetera. For example, you don't have to have a handicap space for a residential home, right? Because if it's a business, you do, but if it's just a house, you don't, right? But we can't discriminate because somebody's in a wheelchair or because somebody has a walker. Race, color, national origin, right? You can't say things like, sorry, we're not renting to Caucasians, right? We can also not say things like, well, there's a bunch of Spanish people living in this neighborhood and you speak Spanish, you should move in, right? That's also discriminatory. Even though you're using it in a positive light, you can't use it, right? Don't move in here because it's ghetto. Don't say these things, right? right? It doesn't matter who they are living there. So what do you do when an agent or when a customer says, can you tell me who lives in the neighborhood? What I do is, most of the time in the afternoons and the weekends, it's busier in the neighborhood. Drive around and take a look. I can't tell you who lives in this neighborhood. Now, if there's some statistical data on a, on a census website, I can give that data because it's deemed to be accurate, right? But I can't speak to any capacity if that makes a neighborhood good or bad. If you want to see if the neighborhood's bad, go and look at the crime statistics, right? Give them the websites so that they can go to. But we can't specifically speak to that. We also can't say things like, nice big house close to the Jewish Orthodox Church, right? Synagogue, right? We can't say that. We can't say that. Why? Because it's, it's advertising that doesn't give you fair housing opportunities. Sex, pretty self-explanatory, I can't say, I'm not gonna rent to you, or I'm not gonna give you a loan because you're a female. Right? I can't do that, right? So, as far as handicaps, we can't say things like no wheelchairs, but we can say things like no smoking. We can say things like no pets, right? Because pets and smokers are not protected classes, right? If I don't want to rent to you because you smoke, 
that's my prerogative. It doesn't matter. If I don't want you to mess up my home because you're smoking in my house, that's my choice. But I can't say I'm not going to rant to you because you might fall because you're using a cane, right? That's not fair housing. Now, familial status is a little bit tricky. Um, I'm not gonna rent you because you're divorced. I'm not gonna rent you because you're old. So that's age, but familial status. I'm not gonna rent you because you have six children, right? Because children mess up houses, right? You can't say that, right? <laughs> However, if you're in a 55 plus community, it's legal to say that somebody under the age of 19 can't live with you for more than a certain time period. Because you are allowing them to come, you're just not allowing them to live with you permanently. But temporarily speaking, you can't. The other thing about 55 plus communities, as long as, and it has to be 80% of the residents, 55 or older. So these Dell Webb communities have, 55 plus communities have 80% or more ownership that's 55 or older. You can be 45 and live in a 55 plus community because you can be part of that 20%. But if you're 45 and living in this 55 plus community, it's the same rules as far as minor children or anything else. So these are empty nester communities. They're, they're uh, allowed to get around that whole age discrimination thing because the majority of their people are the same age and they don't have kids, right? So it says here, all units are occupied by persons 62 or older. So 100% of a Dell Web community could be 62 or older, or 80% could be 55 or older, right? So that and has like a, our, has a strict policy, yeah. right? So like a retirement home is usually like someone who's. The whole thing is 62 and above. Right, so that's why they get away with mm -hmm. the discrimination based on age, right? Right, because everybody 100% is older, right? The other thing about Delaware communities, they have to be registered as a 55 plus community. Now, non protected classes, we talked a little bit about those, right? Pets, smokers. I'm sure there's others, but those are the main ones that come up, right? And we talked about the Equal Housing Opportunity Posters right there. I also have a picture of it in your book. Make copies of it, put them in every room, every office. <laughs> and you're good, right? So, true or false, is it a, it's a violation of the Fair Housing Act to rent to, or to refuse to rent to single college students. True, because of familiar status. True. You can't not. True. Right? <clears throat> is it true, true or is it false? Let's see. I'd say true. Is it true? It's false? not true. Oh. Because I can legally discriminate against college students because they like to party. They're not a protected class. Mm. The the key here is. They trick you with the word single, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Because single, right? yeah. single triggers familial status, right? Yeah. I'm like, that's where I kind of screwed up with like, aren't college students usually single? <laughs> yeah, right. We can discriminate against college students because we don't want them to party and tear our place up. Go drinking and throw up everywhere, right? That's typically what they do, right? It depends on where you're at. But a college student could be 18. A college student could be 60. It doesn't matter. So it's not really a... It's not really age-based, it's what are you, right? Real estate licensees should avoid using proximity to churches and synagogues when advertising listed properties. That's true. Why? Should avoid, yeah. Okay. Why? Because we don't want to steer a certain person to a house based on their religious preference. Because that, why? It's a violation right here. Does it fall under one of these categories? If it falls under one of these categories, fresh corn with no vowels, <laughs> right? Yeah. Then it's easy to remember. Good? Mm -hmm. Okay. The next thing talks about 
Telephone Act, right? Can spam, do not call list, TCPA, Telephone Consumer Protection Act. We know it as the DNC, do not call list, right? I like do not call, do red. If you're on the do not call list, under Florida law, under Florida law, are we allowed to call for sale by owners? Even if they're on the do not call list, under Florida law, are we allowed to call the sale for sale by owners? Yes, because they're advertising their sign on the yard. Under Florida law, the answer is yes. Okay. It's true. Under federal law, it is false. Okay. Because federal law says that we can't, we can't do it under Florida law. Oh. Because federal law supersedes Florida law. But if I ask the question under Florida law, the answer is yes. Okay. Okay. But we can't. Okay. So, so the, that's, yeah, that's the fines true. just increased, but we got to go by the book right now. Florida law is ten thousand. Federal law is sixteen thousand. I want to say it went up to like eighteen thousand or something or twenty-one thousand. But but right now, these are the. So what are the main things on the do not call list? I say it's early to late. What does early to late mean? Early to late means 8 is before 9, 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. We have to call between the hours of 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. 8 is before 9, early is before late. I always like to think of it that way so I don't ever forget. A lot of people mix this up and say 9 to 8. A lot of times the state test says 9 to 8 and you get it wrong because they put the wrong numbers on it. There's two other things that come up, right? The FISBO exception is the one we just talked about. That's not included in the two other things. The two other things is, when am I allowed to call for sell by owners? Or when am I allowed to call business relationships? Or when am I not allowed to call them, right? If somebody's on the do not call list and we sold them a house, and we sold them a house. How long do we get? How long do we get to continue calling them and soliciting them? How long do we get? If I sold them a house and we've had a prior business relationship, the key term is here prior business relationship. You can call them up to 18 months, even if they're on the do not call list. I just sold them a house. I can check in a year from now. Hey, how you doing? You know anybody wants to buy or sell a house? Solicit them, whatever, right? What about if they called on my ad? We'll call this a business inquiry. How long do we get to call them back? Three months. Three months. These are the two things that are going to come up. These are the three things that are going to come up on your state exam. The FISBO exception, they might get you on a technicality on the Florida license, right? Well, Florida, you're allowed to, but, but if you look at the chart, it says right here, no FISBO exception, right? 8 a.m. to 9 p.m., 18 months after an established business relationship has occurred, three months after an inquiry, so a call on an ad, a call on a sign, something like that. So if somebody calls you on your real estate sign and they say, hey, can you tell me about the house, three bedroom, two bath house, 245,000, built in 1940, and they say, okay, thank you, click, they hang up on you, you can call them back. You can call them back for up to three months. Why? Because they called you on your sign, right? What do I usually do? I usually pass it to somebody else and say, hey, call these people. See if you can help them with something else, right? They hung up on you because the price was too high, but maybe we can find something else in their budget, right? So these three things are important to know, especially when you're soliciting somebody over the telephone, right? So then as an associate or a broker, 
if we sold someone a house two years ago, we didn't know at 21, at 20 months or whatever, they put themselves on a do not call. So it's our responsibility to download yearly the do not call check. List. Yeah. Um, well, so we usually download the do not call list quarterly. Okay. okay. Um, if you, as long as you make, as long as you make the effort and you're doing the right things, you're not establishing a pattern. See, the thing with the do not call list is you have to establish a pattern, right? If I'm not, if I'm doing it on a one-off, you're not going to get a fine. But if you're doing it over and over and over and over again, there's going to establish a pattern. When they establish a pattern, and this goes back to contract law, but when you establish a pattern, you don't necessarily have to have a contract. I'm now establishing, I'm doing this over and over and over. Now, if somebody asks you not to call them again, then you don't call them again. If I call one of my established business relationships at month 24, they're probably going to, hey, how's it going? Like, they're going to talk to me, right? Because we have a good relationship. That becomes a friend thing, not a business relationship, right? If it's a business relationship that's tested, it's 18 months. As far as email advertising is concerned, as far as fax advertising is concerned, we have to have contact information for the company. We also have to have an opt-out, right? The key there is the opt-out option, right? That's, that's critical. That's under the Can Spam app, Act. We have, to, we have to provide our physical address for our office. We have to opt you out within 10 days, right? 10 business days. It has to tell you who and who it's coming from. You have to be able to reply to this, right? Reply to language. It can say, don't reply to this email. If you want to reply, reply here, right? Faxes are the same thing. The difference in the fax is because it's not time stamped, we have to put date and time to the fax, right? right? On an email, it's time stamped, right? When you send an email, it's already, it already has date and time. Faxes don't always do that. Register name of the company sending the fax, and phone number of the company sending a fax, or the sending fax machines phone number. Now, what I'm going to tell you is nobody faxes anymore, right? If if they do, it's all spam. So just don't <laughs> buy just don't buy a fax machine to spend money on paper and ink. If you need to learn more, you can go to do not call dot. Obviously, do not do not call.gov. You can actually report people on there. Um, you can actually report text messages on there as well. Um, there is no jurisdiction for that right now, but you can. that's why we're getting a lot of text now because it's not policed by the DNC. Um, but you can report text messages, which I regularly do. <laughs> so Sales associate wants to call prospects and solicit new listings. The sales associate must protect or must check the phone numbers against the do not call list. Is this true or false? Yes. It's true. Because they don't have an established. Because we don't have a relationship. Right. Them, right. The Junk Fax Protection Act applies to residential fax machines only. True or false? Should be false. That's be false. Why? FCC junk fax rules mandate it's unlawful to send unsolicited advertisements to a residential or business fax machine without express invitation or permission. Real estate licensee may be fined ten thousand per call for Florida telemarketing law. That is true. Federal is sixteen thousand. I believe the laws just changed, but those. Those are what they were when the book was written. So it's 10,000, like you just put Florida. Right, so, so it says 16, Florida. Right. That's, that's why you have to, that's why I asked the question earlier, under Florida law, can I call a for sale but under, yes you can, yes you can. Under federal law, you can't, and we're gonna supersede that. Now Florida can find you 10,000, federal law can find you 16, so you can get more, right? As far as summary, we've kind of talked about all this. Uh, we can go over the questions in the exam and see where we're at, the, the actual unit exam. But before we do that, what's, do you have any questions about this exam? No. Or this chapter? 
chapters a lot of information. So what we find is a sales licensing course, this would be two chapters, right? Mm -hmm. This course is one chapter. Um, I'll definitely review, I think, the types of entities for sure. You know, just what I'm going to tell you as far as the types of entities are concerned is that know that joint ventures, know that business trusts, mm -hmm. non incorporated corporations, cooperative associations, and corporation souls cannot be registered. That That's the critical thing you really need to know about those. Also know that corporation sole is not a single owner, right? Sole proprietorship is a single owner. General partnership has to have one broker or all active brokers that are registered, right? Limited partnership must have at least one active broker only when we're dealing with the public in real estate capacity. That, those are the main things you need.